Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to part two of me fixing my 2008 Ford Explorer. Now, if you guys have not seen part one, I will leave a link in the description where you can go back and watch that before continuing on with this video. Now, if you guys have watched that last video, you'll know that where we left off, we got the timing chains installed. So really, all we have left to do is put everything back together, get this thing back up and running, and back on the road. Now, there are a few things that we need to do before we can actually put the thing back together. If you guys remember, I had a big crack in the valve cover, so in this video, I'm gonna show you guys how I'm going to go about patching that thing, because I've decided that it's pretty much still in usable condition. I don't think we really have to replace it. This is something that we can just repair. Also, I'm really excited to show you guys that in this video, we're gonna be replacing the old worn out radiator with a brand new aluminum radiator from the guys over at Alloy Works. I hope you guys stay tuned for that. Anyway, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking in this intro. I've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. All right, guys, so over here on the workbench, I have the valve cover. And as you can see over here, we have our big giant crack. And if you look at the crack, you can see that it extends all the way from the top down all the way to the bottom over here now luckily it doesn't affect the edge as you can see that we don't have a crack along this line because if we did um, then we would probably have to replace this valve cover um, because this is where the gasket seals and so i think what i'm going to try to do is epoxy this thing shut so you can see right through the valve cover looking through the inside you can see the light and you can see the crack where it ends right there but like i said no big deal i think that we can still reuse this valve cover now what i'm going to do is i'm going to clean it up and then i'm going to use some of this uh, steel stick epoxy this stuff i've been using it for a long time it works really well it hardens really fast and when it does harden it's hard like a rock and so uh, first things first, we need to clean up this valve cover and make sure that we don't have any of this oily residue. Now this, I already did run it through the parts washer and so that's really what you're seeing is just kind of the residue from the parts washer. But we wanna make sure that we don't have any residue at all. So I'm just gonna take some of this uh, brake parts cleaner and spray it down. And I'm gonna flip it over and spray the inside. I'm just gonna take a towel and wipe it down here. Just try to get it as clean as possible on the inside. We're not going to epoxy it from the inside. We're gonna be doing it from the outside. So this really doesn't have to be perfectly clean. Now, getting this surface oil-free is only one part of this. What we also wanna do is we wanna to try to roughen up this surface so that the epoxy has something to stick to. If you look at the valve cover, the texture is kind of smooth. And so what we wanna do is just kind of rough up this area around here where we're gonna be sticking the epoxy and just kind of follow along all the way along the crack. And what I'm gonna be using is this uh, 180 grit sandpaper. So I'm gonna take a sheet of this. Then I'm just gonna fold it in half and I'm going to sand along the crack here. Okay, so I've got it sanded down pretty good. Now I'm just gonna blow it off with some compressed air. All right, guys, so change of plans. After sanding this down and getting a much better look at this crack, so you can see that after we sanded this down, we can actually see that this crack extends all the way to this side of the valve cover, up through here, and then, of course, down over here. Now, again, it doesn't look like it affected the edge right here where the gasket seals. Um, however, I don't think that I'm going to want to use the steel stick that I originally thought I was going to use. I think this job is better suited for the uh, two-part epoxy JB Weld. This one here is the quick weld version. Um, so it sets in six minutes and it cures in about uh, four to six hours. And so uh, this I think is gonna spread a little bit easier because this, although it works really well, first of all, I don't think that I'm gonna have enough to run along the entire length of the crack. Second of all, uh, this is gonna do a much better job, I think, of penetrating the actual crack. And so what we're gonna wanna do is kind of fill this crack with the epoxy and then of course cover it on the outside. And so I think this is gonna do a much better job of that. So I'm just gonna spray this down one more time. Make sure we don't have any residue left on there. And then we're gonna use this as our mixing bowl. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the hardener first. We're gonna use a little cap here to poke a hole in it. Uh, we're gonna need quite a bit of this stuff. So I'm going to probably use maybe half of this tube here. So let me squeeze it out. There we go, close this up. Now we can open up our steel. Again, we'll use the cap to poke a hole. So that looks like it should do it. We'll close this up. Now I'm just gonna take this little plastic tool here. Um, this did not come in this kit. I had this in my toolbox. I don't even know where I got it from. Let's go ahead and just use this to mix this up and it's gonna turn uh, nice and gray. 
Uh, I feel like maybe I didn't put enough hardener in there. Let me add a little bit more. That should do it. That's looking pretty good. And now I think we can go ahead and start applying this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use the little fat end of this stick here. Now, you don't have to have a tool like this. Again, I don't even know where I got this from. I just found it in my toolbox. However, if you have something like a popsicle stick, those work really well too. So I'm gonna grab some of this, scoop it up, and then I'm going to start laying it down onto this crack here. And I'm going to lightly apply some downward pressure to try to push it through the crack so that we can fill in that space. We can start working our way down the other side Again, just gently applying some downward pressure to try to fill that crack. Now I'm no Picasso, so please excuse the messy job here. The nice thing about this is that um, this is completely covered. This part of the valve cover is completely covered by the uh, brackets on the front. You won't see this because I think the coil is actually sitting above this. So. And I think that looks pretty good. This stuff's already starting to harden, so I don't think there's much else we can do. So there we have it, guys. Again, not the prettiest work of art. However, this should do the job. Now, the main reason I didn't put any epoxy on the inside, I only wanted to put it on the outside, is because if we put epoxy on the inside, once this epoxy hardens, it's rock hard. And if it doesn't bond to the wall properly or this plastic, then it can actually start to chip away. And once it starts chipping away, you don't want any of that getting inside the engine because of course it can get sucked up by the oil pickup tube. It can block the screen, can cause major damage in your engine. We wanna avoid any of that happening. So again, we're only gonna put epoxy on the outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and let that valve cover dry while I install the other side. All right, guys, so fast forward. It's been a couple of hours now since we applied the epoxy and it's pretty much set. This stuff feels really solid now. And so I think we're good to go. I'm gonna start by removing these bolts and replacing these little grommets um, because the valve cover gaskets did come with new ones. Here they are, little blue rubber O-rings. We'll clean out the little hole here and then we'll take our bolt with the new O-ring on there and shove it back through. And once we do all of these bolts, we're gonna go ahead and install the gasket. Now we're ready to install it on the truck. All right guys, so now we have both of our valve covers installed. As you can see, we got pretty good coverage with that epoxy. It is now fully dried and cured, hard as a rock, and we've got 100% coverage all the way around. And so I'm pretty happy with the results. I think that's gonna last the lifetime of the vehicle. Anyway, now that we got that done, we can move on to installing the water pump, the crank sensor, the brackets on the front, the intake manifold, the radiator, and then the fan clutch. Okay guys, so a quick tip, if you are doing this job, there is one step you wanna make sure you don't skip over, and that is to clean out or replace the oil restrictor rod. So if you look right here next to the hydraulic tensioner, 
Um, on the front of the engine, you can see there is a little Torx plug on the cylinder head. You're gonna wanna remove this. It's a T30 Torx bit, and there is a restrictor rod inside of there. You wanna pull it out and clean it out. Now, if you look at this little baggie, you can see that in the kit that we bought, we actually got a new oil restrictor rod, and it also came with the little plug. So we are going to be replacing it. I've got my T30 bit right here on my quarter inch drive ratchet. So let me go ahead and remove it. So I'm gonna use this T30 to break it loose. There is our plug. I'm gonna use my flashlight to take a look down the hole. Okay, so I've got these thin needle nose pliers. Let me see if I can pull it out. Try to get a hold of it. Mm. Not easy to do. It is way in there. Oh, I almost had it. Just went back in. I think I got it. Here we go, I'm gonna grab it with my hand. And this is our oil restrictor rod here. And like I said, you're gonna wanna make sure this port is clean. So I'm gonna take a piece of this welding wire and I'm gonna use my flashlight to shine down in there. And we are going to make sure there is no restriction in this hole. I'm just gonna kind of wiggle it around, make sure we clear up this hole, pull it back out. Looks pretty good to me. All right guys, so in my case, um, when I put the two side by side, the old restrictor rod and the new restrictor rod, uh, the new one is a little bit shorter than the older one. Not by much, maybe a quarter inch or so. However, I did feel like I had enough trouble trying to get the original one out of there. I don't want to put the shorter one in there and not be able to get it back out at all. And so I think that I'm just going to go ahead and put the original one back in there. There's nothing wrong with this part. It's fully intact. I've already gone ahead and cleaned it up. So I'm going to go ahead and stick it back into the hole. I'm going to replace the plug. I did put a little bit of Teflon tape on there. So I'm going to start by screwing it in. Then we'll tighten it back down. And that should do it. All right, so let's continue by putting the rest of this back together. All right guys, as you can see, I've got most of the engine put back together. Got the intake manifold installed, torqued down with brand new gaskets. I've got the front pulleys installed, the brackets, the alternator, AC compressor, water pump, the serpentine belt, all of that is installed. Also, I took the liberty of repairing a lot of this uh, wiring loom that was broken. A lot of this plastic wiring loom on the harness was uh, essentially disintegrated. So there was a lot of bare wire and I didn't want to leave it that way because a lot of this wire rests up against these metal brackets. And so I went ahead and re-insulated uh, this harness that goes down to the starter, the other one that goes down to the crank sensor, and also this one that goes to the coolant temp sensor. And then on top of that, I want to show you guys something that I do have to repair. Now, this is actually something I've been running into a lot with this truck in particular. And I'm not sure what it is about the wiring, um, but if you look at the connector here and you see where these wires are taped together, they're actually bare. And so I don't know if this is an issue because they tied this so tight. So I actually cut back some of this plastic loom so that we can see what's underneath. And you can see that they wrapped the end of the harness here with some tape and they did it really tight. And so you can see that over time with heat and vibration, a lot of this insulation started to crumble away. And so you can see as I just pick at this, it easily crumbles away. And so now we have a bunch of exposed wire that's touching each other. Also, we got some corrosion starting to happen here. And so before I just connect this thing and go on about my day, I am going to uh, repair this wiring right here. I'm going to re-insulate this. And so I just wanted to show you guys because 
This is not the only connector I've had to do. I've actually had to do it to several connectors, uh, one of them being the mass airflow sensor. So uh, the mass airflow sensor connector over here, I also had to repair because it was doing the same thing. Also for the fan clutch, this is a connector here. I had to do the same thing as well. I had to repair all of that wiring. Oh, and also the EGR valve where the DPFE sensor is, this connector did the same thing. And so I had to repair that one. Anyway, like I said, I just wanted to show you guys because it seems to be a pretty common problem amongst this era of Ford vehicles. All right, guys, so the moment has come. It's time to install the radiator. I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited too. Let's open up this package. Wow, guys, check that out. All right, guys, so here's our brand new all aluminum radiator from the guys over at Alloy Works. Now, if you guys have never heard of Alloy Works, you're not alone. They're a fairly new company. They've only been on the market for a couple of years now. You can check them out at their website. You can also look on YouTube and find a lot of other review videos on these radiators. And let me tell you right now, just having it right here in front of me, I am blown away by the quality of this product. Take a look at the welds here. These are all hand TIG weld. You can see that every part of this radiator is TIG welded together. So not only does this look awesome, but it also seals really well. Now, every single radiator that comes out of the facility is pressure tested. And so this is made to make a perfect seal. Now, the other cool thing about this radiator is that it's designed to be a direct replacement for the factory original equipment. So if you take a look at the position of the upper hose and the lower hose, you can see that they match exactly with the original one. Also, if you take a look at the transmission cooler lines, you can see that they're located in the exact same spot. Now, the other thing I think that is really cool, on this aluminum version, we're doing away with this flimsy little tank in here. So if you guys remember from the last video, I showed you that this radiator actually has an internal transmission cooler inside of this plastic housing here, and that cooler is just kind of suspended. You guys can see that I can wiggle this thing around, move it around with my fingers, and that thing is just flopping around in there. Now take a look at the aluminum radiator, and you can see that we have these fully welded solid cooler line connections. And so we no longer have to worry about the internal tank in here leaking and causing coolant to get into your transmission. The other cool thing is check out the drain cock over here. You can see that it's a high quality brass piece. And on the factory one, we just have this little plastic thing right here. So not only is this aluminum radiator gonna last much longer than the factory one, because first of all, we're doing away with these flimsy plastic tanks on the radiator, which I think is a stupid design anyway. I don't know why manufacturers ever went to putting plastic on radiators, but this aluminum radiator is also gonna cool 35 to 45% better than the original one. And the biggest reason for that is actually the core size. So take a look at the thickness of the core on this radiator. Now, I'm not exactly sure of the measurement here, but if you take a look at the factory one, what you'll actually notice is that the core is actually a lot thinner than what it could have been. So if you look at the bottom tank here, you can see how much room Ford left when building this radiator. So you can see that this core could have actually been a whole nother inch wider. Even looking at it from the top here, you can see how much room Ford left between the edge of the tank here. However, in this case, the manufacturer decided to go all the way. And so we have a much wider core, a much larger cooling capacity, and it shouldn't affect the way it fits in the vehicle. So as you guys can see, the factory radiator is actually bolted into this plastic bracket here, which actually houses the AC condenser. So if we look on the back side, this is our AC condenser back here. And so what we're gonna need to do is remove this factory radiator from this factory bracket and swap it over with the aluminum one. All right, guys, so it went into the bracket just like the factory one did. The awesome thing is that they included all of the tabs like the original radiator has. So up here is where the overflow tank goes. You can see that we have uh, these bolt holes and clips. And then, of course, we had the two that came in from the side for the bracket over here. And then they even welded on the bolt holes that go on the back of the radiator down here. So you guys can see one, two, three, four. This is where the deflector for the bumper clips onto. This is the last little piece that I need to install and it just fits right over those brackets. And now we're ready to install this into the truck. All right guys, so as you can see, I have the brand new radiator installed, everything bolted up just like the factory. This thing looks great. However, the only problem I'm running into right now 
is that I cannot connect the transmission line. So if you look down there, you can see our two transmission lines. We have one right here and one down here. And again, you can see the holes for the transmission cooler in the radiator. Now, the only problem is that the sizing for the holes or the fittings on the radiator are much smaller than the fitting from the factory. So if you guys take a look over here, again, if you remember, this thing had the Ford quick connect fitting. Personally, I hate these fittings. They're an awful design, very difficult to get them to disconnect. And so I don't mind doing away with this fitting. However, the fittings that they gave me, so they came in a little baggy. We have two different designs. Uh, one of them looks much like you would find on a GM where it has this uh, clip fitting right here. And then of course we have the threaded part that goes into the radiator. However, this design does not fit on this particular line. You can see that this doesn't even fit in there. The other fitting that they gave us was this nipple here. Now this nipple would be great. However, the size of the nipple itself is way too small. Take a look at the size difference here. So I tried to do some research and I found that the size for the fitting on this aluminum radiator is a 3 8 size. And so what I needed was a fitting that basically went from a 3 8 size thread to a half inch size nipple. Because essentially my plan is to do away with the Ford quick disconnect and what we're going to do is basically run a half inch rubber hose from the end of the transmission line to the nipple on the radiator. And so initially I ordered this fitting off of Amazon and it said it was a 3 8 NTP to a half inch barb. And so this half inch barb is exactly what we need because it matches up with the factory line. However, it turns out the 3 8 NTP is actually a little bit thicker than 3 8 with an inverted flare. This is not a 3 8 NTP. And so I set out on a mission to try to find a fitting that was a 3 8 inverted flare on one side and a half inch barb or nipple on the other side. But everywhere I looked, nobody had one. It seems like that's a combination that just nobody manufactures. And so during a trip to the auto parts, I ran across this one here. This is actually a Dorman part. I have the box right here. You can see the part number there at the top, 785 dash 408d and what this is is a 3 8 by 3 8 fitting that has an inverted flare so if you take a look at the threaded part you can see that we have an inverted flare on the inside and so this is going to screw right into the radiator however on the other side we only have a 3 8 and so this is definitely an improvement over the one that they sent me however it's not quite half an inch Take a look at the fitting up against the factory line. It's pretty close, but it's one size down. And so there are a couple things that we could do. We could buy a barb fitting that's a half inch on one side and a three eighths on the other side, and basically just use that to adapt to this fitting. However, I couldn't find one locally, and so I had to order it online. This truck's already been sitting for too long, and I really want to get it started. And so as a temporary rig, I went out to the hardware store and I bought some of this clear plastic tubing, and I'm basically gonna slide this over the nipple, cut the end of it off, and now we have something that's closer to the thickness of a half inch. Now I know some of you guys are gonna cringe, but I've already checked and a half inch rubber hose fits right over this piece. And it's actually a really tight seal around this nipple. Now I don't recommend you guys do this and I wouldn't be doing this if this was a customer's vehicle, but this is my personal car and I'm desperate just to get this thing running. So for now, I'm gonna use this as a temporary fix. A few moments later. All right guys, to so fast forward, I've got the lines installed. So take a look down here, you can see Again, I use those uh, 3 8 inverted flare line fittings and some half inch hose on both sides. And so now we have a good tight seal. I feel pretty confident about this. So now the only thing left to do is reinstall the fan clutch, the fan shroud, the coolant tank, and the air intake. All right guys, so as you can see, I've got the rest of the engine put back together. I went ahead and I filled it up with engine oil, 5W30 full synthetic motorcraft. I also went ahead and I topped it up with antifreeze uh, coolant. And then I also went ahead and filled up the power steering fluid reservoir because I did lose all of the fluid in the reservoir because I had this tipped over and it all leaked out. Anyways, now that the fluids are all topped off, I'm just about ready to start this engine. 
However, like I said, before we actually start the engine, we want to prime it first. And so what we're going to do is run this without the fuel pump relay. So as you guys can see, this is the fuel pump relay here. It lives in the socket right here. I already pulled it out. And so this gives us the ability to crank the engine over without it starting. Now you want to make sure that you crank the engine for at least 30 to 60 seconds to get the oil flowing through the system, to get some pressure behind the timing chain tensioners before you actually start it. Now, the other thing that you might notice is that I also went ahead and I lifted up the vehicle and put it on jack stands all the way around and I made sure that it was level because we're also going to have to top off the transmission fluid. If you guys remember, I had the transmission lines disconnected and so we actually lost quite a bit of fluid. So we need to put transmission fluid back into the transmission and make sure that it's level. Now, if you guys didn't know, this truck does not come equipped with a dipstick for the transmission. So we are going to have to pump the fluid up from the bottom. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. First, we need to get the engine started, let it run for about 10 minutes to get the transmission to operating temperature. Then we can go underneath the vehicle and pump in the fluid. So first things first, let's crank this engine over and get it primed. That should be good enough. Our battery's starting to get low. So let me go ahead and plug in our fuel pump relay. I'm gonna cycle the key a couple times to prime the fuel pump. Then we're gonna see if this thing starts up. Okay, that does not sound good. What did I forget? 11 minutes later. Okay guys, so I found some spark plug cables that were swapped over. Hopefully that's gonna do the trick. Okay guys, something's not right. All right guys, so as you can see, I'm running into a little bit of a problem. However, I think I have figured out what the issue is. Now, as you saw, the truck actually starts and runs. However, after running for a few seconds, it starts to run really, really rough and then it stalls out. So first of all, let me take you guys over to the scan tool that I have right here and we can look at what code we have stored. So I'm gonna click on read fault code. We're gonna retrieve continuous memory data trouble codes. And as you guys can see, we have this P0193, fuel rail pressure sensor high input. Now, I already checked to make sure that the fuel rail pressure sensor is plugged in, and it is. But before I show you where I think the problem is, let me show you a little bit of live data first. So we're gonna go into the data stream. I'm gonna select a few data pids that I wanna focus on. Okay, so here are the data pids I wanna show you guys. And so first of all, if you take a look at the fuel rail pressure, the desired pressure, the computer is wanting to see right now about 56 PSI. However, if you look down here at the actual fuel rail pressure, you can see that we're up at 77.25 PSI. Then looking at the fuel rail pressure voltage, you can see we're at five volts. This five volts is coming from the five volt reference source. Now, as you guys can see, the computer has realized that there is an error. So you can see right here. And if we scroll down here, you can look at the fuel rail temperature sensor which is actually part of the fuel rail pressure sensor, you can see that we have no error. And if we look down here, you can actually see that we're at 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So like I said, I've already verified that it's plugged in. And we know it is because on the scan tool, we can see that the temperature sensor is working. Now, what I wanna do is start the engine up and show you guys what happens when it's running. You can see the engine is running. Now, the first thing that I noticed on the scan tool, if you guys look up here at the top, you can see that our camshaft and crankshaft position sensors are synchronized. So that's telling us that our timing is good. Now, again, if you take a look at the fuel rail pressure, you can see that our desired is somewhere around 40 PSI. However, the actual fuel pressure reading from our fuel rail pressure sensor is still at 77.25 PSI. And our voltage is still the five volt reference. Now the engine is starting to run pretty rough. Let me scroll down to the fuel trims and show you what's happening. So if you guys take a look at the fuel trims, you can see that the computer is cutting way back on the fuel. However, it does look like it's starting to compensate because earlier uh, they were both showing really negative. And so that's why the engine is running rough installing because the computer is cutting back all of the fuel so either we have one of two problems for one we could have a bad fuel rail pressure sensor which is probably not unlikely because these are a common failure item on fords i'm really hoping it's not a bad fuel rail pressure sensor because it's underneath the intake manifold and i'm gonna have to pull all of that back off just to replace it the other problem that we could have is a wiring problem you guys can see that our connector right here 
if I move it, there's actually some bare wire here. Now, if you guys remember from earlier, I explained that a lot of these connectors on this wiring harness have the same issue where the insulation has basically disintegrated and these wires could be touching each other. And so what I wanna to try to do first is unplug this connector, open up this wiring loom and repair those open wires. Okay, so I managed to unplug the connector and pull it out. And when I peeled back the wiring loom, again, there was this piece of tape here that they used to join all the wires together and you can see that where they were tightly packed together, the insulation has totally disintegrated and these wires are actually touching each other. I mean, just look how this stuff is just crumbling away. Anyway, I'm gonna repair this wiring, reconnect the connector, and see if we can start this thing up. All right, so for those of you who are wondering how I'm going about repairing this connector, um, so basically what I do is I use a T-pin to release the clip on the inside of the connector. I've already taken out this little uh, white locking tab right here. So once you take this locking tab out, uh, you can use something like a T-pin uh, to push on that clip and then you can pull the wire out from the back side. I have the terminal right here. And now once we have this terminal out, we can actually just slide a piece of heat shrink tubing over the wire. Then once you have the heat shrink over the wire, we can go ahead and take a heat gun, heat this thing up. Once you've done that, your wire is pretty much re-insulated. You can go ahead and stick it back into the connector and you should be good to go. Now, for those of you wondering why I'm not actually replacing the wire, well, it's because the wiring integrity is still good. There's nothing really wrong with the wire. It's just that the insulation around it had become weak and started to fall apart. And so re-insulating the wires should be good enough to get you back on the road. All right, guys, so the fun doesn't stop here. <laughs> Anyways, I got the fuel rail pressure sensor issue resolved. So if you guys take a look at the scan tool here, let me show you that our fuel rail pressure, again, if you look at our desired, you can see that it's at 56 PSI. However, our fuel rail pressure right now is less than one PSI. Now, let me show you what happens when I cycle the key on to prime the fuel pump. So I'm turning the key off and then back on. Pay attention to the fuel rail pressure. You can see it went up to 59, but watch what's happening as it starts to drop. 13, 12, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, two, one. And so we are losing all of our fuel pressure in the fuel rail. And I think I know what's happening because I just tried to crank the engine over and it sounded like the engine wanted to hydrolock. Now, I'm sorry I didn't catch that on camera, but I don't want to attempt to try it again because I am actually worried about hydrolocking this engine. It seems to me like one of these fuel injectors might actually be stuck open and continuously leaking fuel into one of the cylinders. Now that actually makes sense because earlier when I had the truck running, it was running really rough and I had a bunch of smoke coming out of the tailpipe. And when I say a bunch of smoke, I mean a lot, a lot of smoke and it smelled like unburned fuel. However, at the time, because I was having this issue with the fuel rail pressure sensor, I thought maybe it had something to do with that. But as you guys can see, we already fixed the issue with the fuel rail pressure sensor. It's working now. However, now that the sensor is working, we can see that the fuel rail is not holding pressure. So the question is, which one of these injectors is leaking? Also, before cranking the engine over again, we're gonna have to remove all of the spark plugs in order to avoid hydrolocking this engine. Like I said, guys, the fun here never ends. All right, guys, so I went ahead and I pulled all six spark plugs out. Then I cranked the engine over and it was pretty obvious where our bad fuel injector is. So if you take a look over here, you can see we have gasoline all over the side of the truck here. And all of that gasoline came out of our cylinder number one spark plug hole. Luckily for me, the fuel injector that's bad is actually the fuel injector that's the easiest to get to. So if you look at this fuel injector right here, that is the closest one to the front. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe I can actually replace this fuel injector without having to remove the intake manifold. So anyways, guys, I'm tired. I'm calling it a night. I'm gonna head out to the parts store tomorrow to buy a fuel injector and we're gonna replace it. Hopefully we can get this thing up and running because right now this truck is starting to become my worst nightmare. Tomorrow. All right, guys, so fast forward. I've got the fuel injector out. This is our old one. And uh, essentially what I was able to do was actually just unbolt the fuel rail on this side, lift up on it and remove the fuel injector. So I did save myself a lot of time not having to remove the intake manifold. And so I did get lucky there. Now this is our brand new fuel injector, Ford Motorcraft. And so I'm gonna go ahead install this fuel injector i'll put the spark plugs back in and let's see if we can start this thing all right guys so the moment of truth has come i'm getting ready to try and start this thing um, i have all the spark plugs installed i went ahead and i replaced that one fuel injector 
Uh, the only thing right now I think that I'm worried about is whether or not I did any damage to the engine when I had the hydro locking condition because um, like I said, I went to crank the engine over, it spun for a quick second and then bam, it stopped. It didn't want to turn after that. So I am kind of worried that, you know, maybe I did some damage to the engine. I'm hoping that I didn't bend a connecting rod or anything like that. But the only way for us to find out is to start this thing up and see if the engine knocks. All right guys, so as you can see, we are still blowing a bunch of smoke out of the tailpipe. Now, I don't know if this is residual from the fuel injector that was stuck open. And so maybe this is just leftover fuel in the exhaust that needs to burn out. So I'm gonna let this run for a few minutes and hopefully the smoke goes away. All right guys, so after running about 15 minutes, so far the engine sounds great and our smoke has come down a whole lot. You guys can see we still have a little bit of smoke coming out of the tailpipe, but not as much as we had before. I think if we give it a good test drive, we should be able to burn the rest of the fuel out of the exhaust system. Now take a look at the scan tool. If we come over here, I can show you guys. First of all, take a look at our fuel rail pressure. Up here we have our desired. Down here we have the actual fuel rail pressure and you can see they match perfectly. And so we were able to fix the issue with the fuel rail pressure sensor just by fixing the wiring. Luckily, we didn't have to replace the sensor. And now take a look at these fuel trims. You can see our long term here, still hanging somewhere around zero. It's still got some learning to do. And looking here at the short-term fuel trims, uh, bank one and bank two, you can see we're sitting pretty close to zero, kind of going negative, kind of going positive, a little bit back and forth. However, nothing here looks out of range. And so I'm pretty sure a good test drive is all this truck needs. Now, before we can go anywhere, we're gonna have to top off the transmission fluid. So let's move underneath the truck and I'll show you how we do that. All right, guys, so let me show you what I'm gonna be using in order to pump fluid into this transmission. So first of all, you're gonna need some type of fitting that screws into the fill plug at the bottom of the transmission. In my case, I found this at the Home Depot. I think it only cost me a couple of dollars, if that. Now, I'm not exactly sure what size this is off the top of my head. I will try to put it up on the screen here. That way, if you guys need one, you can head over to your local hardware store and pick one up. Second of all, you're gonna need some type of pump. In my case, I found this pump down at the local auto parts store. It only cost me about 10 or $15. And this is actually made to screw onto the bottle top of whatever oil it is you're using. Now, some oil bottles come with a smaller uh, cap on it. And so this is actually made to fit both. And then finally, the last thing that we're gonna need is a piece of 3 8 tubing. In my case, I picked up a roll of this stuff. Again, over at my local Home Depot, uh, this is the size you need, a 3 8 inch ID. I chose a clear vinyl because I like to be able to see through it. And so you're gonna need to cut off about a foot of that because this is what's actually gonna fit on the end of this brass fitting. So as you guys can see, the tube fits right onto the end of this fitting here. And then the other end of the tube is gonna fit onto this hose coming off of this pump. So anyway, I'm gonna move underneath the vehicle and I'm gonna start by pumping in maybe three or four quarts to begin with because I know I lost quite a bit of fluid when I had the transmission lines removed. Now, an important thing to note, before you open up the fill plug at the bottom of the transmission, you wanna make sure that you have the transmission fully warmed up. And so you need to let the engine run for at least 10 to 15 minutes before you remove the fill plug underneath. Now this procedure of topping off the fluid must be done with the engine running the whole time. This would be different if we were to have actually dropped the pan, dumped all of the fluid out of the pan, and we had to start with nothing in the pan. In that case, yes, you're gonna wanna pump up fluid into the pan before you start up the engine. However, in our case, we didn't lose all of the fluid in the pan, we're just topping it off. And so now that our engine is warmed up, our transmission is fully warmed up. Let's move underneath and pump some fluid up into this transmission. All right guys, so underneath the truck, you can see this is our transmission oil pan. And if you look right here, this here is our drain plug. However, if you look in the center of the drain plug, you're gonna see that we have a little Torx plug right there. And that is a T30 Torx that you're gonna need to take and loosen just the plug on the inside here. Now, when you remove this plug, Make sure you have a drain pan ready because you might have some fluid coming out of here. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove this plug. And now we can go ahead and take our brass fitting and screw it into the hole. Then we're gonna take the hose to our pump and stick it onto the end. And now I'm gonna start pumping the fluid up into the transmission. You guys can see how that fluid's making its way up there. And now we're pumping it into the transmission manually by hand. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this is quite a workout, but this is a lot cheaper than buying an expensive fluid pump.
All right, back upstairs inside the cab. I'm going to go ahead and row through the gears. So reverse. I usually count maybe 10 to 15 seconds, and then I'll shift into neutral. Do the same thing. Count 10 to 15 seconds. Shift into drive. Once again, 10 to 15 seconds. Back to park. You guys can see our transmission fluid is up to about 122 degrees right now. So it's time to go ahead and pull the hose and check our fluid level. All right, guys. So at this point, you want to make sure you have a drain pan ready. I've got one down here. We're going to go ahead and pull the hose. Now you guys can see that this is coming out as a constant stream. What we want to do is let this drain out until it's no longer a constant stream. Once it starts to dribble out of the hole, then we can go ahead and put our plug back in. Now for those of you who are curious how this works, basically there is a tube in the center of that plug and that tube extends upward into the inside of the oil pan. Now that tube is actually made at the height where the manufacturer wants the fluid level. And so basically what we're doing is we are overfilling the transmission, then we're letting it drain back out so that this thing can self level. All right, so as you guys can see, it's now starting to dribble out. So let's go ahead and remove our brass fitting. Now we can put our plug back in. We'll snug it down and we're done. All right guys, so I've been driving this thing now for about 45 minutes or so. And let me tell you right now, this thing feels amazing. I haven't felt this truck this powerful in years. Now, I don't know what it is about it, but man, it feels like it gets up and goes now. Uh, the transmission shifting great. I think it really needed fluid to begin with because uh, I think earlier in the very first video, I mentioned that I had some issues with the uh, transmission uh, not shifting properly, but man, ever since uh, I topped off the fluids here, this transmission is shifting great, nice and smooth. And, uh, you know, it did take a little bit of time for it to figure out the shifting points, uh, but within about 10 or 15 minutes worth of driving, I think this thing pretty much figured it all out. And so this truck is running great, guys. I'm ecstatic. Take a look at the uh, instrument cluster. You can see that we have no check engine light, no warning lights at all. I got 155,000 miles on the odometer and this thing feels like it's still got plenty more to go also if you take a look at the uh, coolant gauge over here on the side you can see that we're running right in the center right where we want to be so this radiator is doing its job it's keeping this engine nice and cool and so i'm really happy about that anyways guys i'm gonna end the video here you can see i'm sitting in an empty garage so pretty much ready for my next project which is probably going to be this nitro behind me so Stay tuned if you guys want to see that. I'm probably going to be rebuilding the engine. Uh, long story on that one. Some of you guys might be familiar with my Dodge Nitro. It's basically been sitting for like two years with a bad engine. So yeah, I think it's time for me to finally get it up and running. So that's probably going to be the next project on the list here. I hope you guys stay tuned for that. Anyways, I've been driving the Ford Explorer now for about four days and it's been my main work vehicle. So I've driven it quite a bit in these past four days going from shop to shop. And so, so far the truck runs great. No check engine light, no issues, no overheating. The radiator works great. I'm super happy with the way it came out. It was a lot of work, but I think in the end, it was really worth it for me. Now, if you guys are looking to upgrade to an aluminum radiator for your vehicle, make sure you check out the guys over at Alloy Works. I will leave a link in the description. I'm also gonna leave you guys a coupon code so you can save some money off your purchase. These radiators are awesome. You won't be disappointed. Anyway, like I always say, thank you for watching the video. I hope you found it useful, informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.